one of St. John Henry Newman's own prayers. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. May the Lord support us all the day long, till the shades lengthen and the evening comes, and the busy world is hushed, and the fever of life is over, and our work is done. Then in his mercy may he give us a safe lodging and holy rest and peace at the last. Amen. St. John Henry Newman, pray for us. So for those who have not attended the previous lectures, just a quick word on the inspiration for this series. Members of the faculty and administration came together and decided that a lecture series of this kind was one important way to commemorate the extraordinary life and contributions of John Henry Cardinal Newman. Throughout these four days, our excellent faculty are providing thoughtful reflections on the life, influences, and impact of this great saint. Christendom College, an institution very much formed in the spirit of Newman's idea of a university is a fitting place to foster deeper understanding of and reflection on his life. We heard from Dr. Adam Schwartz on Monday, who set the stage by exploring Newman's conversion to Roman Catholicism. And yesterday, Dr. Bracey Bursnack had us contemplating the philosophical habit of mind, which is the mark of a truly liberal education. We thank them both for their insights. Today, Dr. Brendan McGuire will provide us with another great opportunity to learn more about the life and thought of St. John Henry Newman. Particularly for those watching this as a recording, Dr. McGuire is an associate professor of history at Christendom College. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Christendom and both his MA and PhD from St. Louis University. Dr. McGuire's expertise is in medieval Europe, the Crusades, and Byzantine Latin relations, among other things. He's an excellent teacher, a popular lecturer, and has been published on a variety of scholarly topics. He recently engaged in field work in the Middle East, primarily to study an important and ancient Islamic military fortress in the Golan Heights. This trip also allowed Dr. McGuire to return to Istanbul, where he had studied in the field in 2013. His previous research and his subsequent writings were significant contributions to the academic landscape. His recent visits and research will no doubt bear much good fruit as well. Today, Dr. McGuire will be giving us a lecture entitled Newman's Historical Epistemology. Please welcome to the podium, Dr. Brendan McGuire. Thanks for that introduction, Mark. I'm, I was looking around to see who you, what guy you were talking about. But, uh, so uh, I promise I won't pull a Marco Rubio with the water bottle here. We'll, we'll stick that in a safe place. Uh, so <laughs> in any event. Pardon, pardon my jokes, they're all appropriate. Um, so, um, Newman's historical epistemology, it sounds like a dry subject. Most people don't think of Newman as a historian, uh, partly because he's, uh, he's so good at so many other things, kind of like most people don't think of Babe Ruth as a pitcher, right? Uh, and yet he was, right? Um, there's a great scholar named Edward Short, um, who's, I, I have an um, introduction from him on the historian in Newman, uh, which, I think illustrates some of the truths about Newman's gifts as a historian, but it also illustrates what people miss sometimes about Newman as a historian. So Edward Short says, and I quote, uh, he says, the historian in Newman, the historian in Newman was essential, not only to the convert in him, but also to the good shepherd as well. History is a noble art, and when it is taken up by someone of Newman's genius, it is a wonder to behold. Newman was a good historian and he presents his interpretation of events not so much in formal, full-dress histories as in his occasional writings, sermons, extended essays, autobiographical writings, and letters which give his readings of history an immediacy and an éclat not always present in more conventional histories." Unquote. So uh, it's a very interesting assessment there from Short, and it is correct as far as it goes. Um, what surprised me when I read it was that um, Short said nothing about the fact that Newman also did write full-dress histories, right? He wrote full-dress histories, which would have been reputation-making uh, for anything else. I, I would love to have written one thing that was one half as good as one of Newman's full-dress histories. Uh, one of his greatest and earliest works is his work on the Arians of the fourth century, which will be something that we're talking about today. Uh, so I think one caution that we have to have when approaching uh, a subject like Newman, part of the reason why we're able to have a whole lecture series of this kind, right, is that to collate uh, and to master Newman's literary output would be beyond any one man, 
Uh, I think it would be the work of many lifetimes, even for the great Newman scholars, uh, right? I, I don't think Ian Carr would say he's mastered uh, Newman's oeuvre. I mean, I, I doubt that Ian Carr would, would say that. Uh, in the 130 years since the death of Cardinal Newman, there have been scholars who have given their whole careers to Newman's thought. The body of literature devoted to Newman's thought <laughs> includes contributions in virtually every European tongue, and it's one of the few bodies of literature that's larger than Newman's own works. All right, so, so <laughs> unpacking Newman, it, it's a tremendously intimidating thing, right? Uh, people have compared Newman to, to Shakespeare and the Bible in terms of the, the amount of secondary literature that's devoted to it, right? Um, so now there might be some immediate objections then to my taking up this subject today, the subject of Newman's historical epistemology. Uh, first of all, what is historical epistemology? It sounds incredibly dense, it sounds incredibly heavy. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, very simply, it means the kind of knowing that is proper to the historian's craft. What does it mean when we say that we can know something through historical science, or through the historian's craft, or through the historian's art? Okay. Now, this is going to be a difficult subject for anyone. Giving a full account of uh, Newman's historical epistemology would be difficult even for experts on Newman's thought, which I cannot claim to be. Uh, and then one might also ask, why does it seem appropriate from amidst all the great riches of Newman's writings, both as an Anglican and as a Catholic, why would I focus specifically on his insights and contributions as a historian? So I think kind of to answer the twin objections at once, I'd say it's actually the, the difficulty of the subject is outweighed by its timeliness for the church and for the historical profession, and especially for scholars who seek to serve the church in her mission in today's world, both within and outside the professional academy. Uh, I would note that the, the very nature of our historical knowing, right, not only the question of how to approach the past, but whether we can know anything about the past at all, it's been the subject of a few decades worth of interminable, often incoherent debate within the profession, right? Within the historical profession, you have some highly influential intellectual movements that have arisen, some of which have sought to reduce history either to some species of literary criticism, and if you reduce history to some species of literary criticism, then what happens? Uh, historical scholarship becomes all about the preoccupations of the present day, ideological preoccupations, emotional preoccupations, cultural preoccupations of the present day. Uh, and of course, we know what those are today. Anything you ever wanted to know about sexual or gender expression in late antiquity, you can find in an academic journal or at a, a conference. Um, it, it, it's amazing, right? Um, but and the other option is that it becomes some kind of similarly fad-driven, if not literary criticism, then some other kind of soft science in which the dominant trends in sociology and anthropology, however sophisticated they may be, are painted onto the past as onto a blank canvas, right? You take whatever trends are, are current in sociology or the social sciences, you take them off the shelf and you apply them to the past. And it's a great way to, uh, it, it gives you sort of instant dissertation, right? You just put it in the microwave and a dissertation comes out. Um, you can get a lot of conference papers and, and other small publications this way. Um, and this is, this is really fascinating though, because what happens then is the historian becomes an artist with his mind. Instead of a trained intellect, seeking truth or seeking the past, the historian becomes an artist using theoretical models, whatever's in vogue, whether it's gender theory, anthropology, sociology, psychology, these theories are constantly changing and the fads come and go often quite uh, rapidly. Uh, Neo-Marxism is one that's had some staying power, in, uh, certainly in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, but you become an artist with your mind, just like a modern philosopher, right? And so it's the intelligible past then disappears for the historian. The intelligible past goes away. Uh, so these trends have tended to transform the study of the past from an enterprise in which a trained intellect is seeking real knowledge into something quite different. And I think uh, if I can make an imperfect analogy to the history of philosophy, there's something to be found here in the departure of philosophy from traditional realism since Descartes. Uh, now, I'm, I'm sorry if this analogy limps or if it obscures more than it illuminates or if I just don't know as much about philosophy as I think I do, but, uh, which is possible. But, you know, the, the ancients and the medievals took it for granted that the intellect could know real things as they were. And that was the point of philosophy, right? The point was to know real things. The moderns, beginning with Descartes, they, they undermine philosophical realism so thoroughly as to render the whole enterprise of philosophy all about other things, right? Whether it's the study of our own knowledge, the study of our own experience, the study of ourselves, um, reality outside of the mind becomes inaccessible or it's the product of the mind. So the philosopher either has to become an artist with his mind, unmoored from any fealty to an external reality at all, or even less attractively, I think much more boringly, the philosopher becomes a mere describer 
of language and its uses. And this can happen to historians too. Now the philosophy analogy, it might obscure more than it illuminates. Uh, the average Christian or Catholic it doesn't get up every morning and check his iPhone for day-to-day -day updates on the latest developments in analytic philosophy uh, because it's too boring uh, and, and, and nobody cares. Um, but you, you notice it, right? You notice it when you, you feel like your faith is being challenged, right? When you have scholars and experts in the secular sciences expressing wildly heterodox opinions about the life of Christ, about the mission of the apostles, about the pre-Nicene church, you know? If Jesus was just a Gnostic preacher with a wife and his original religion was some grab bag of occult mysticism from Babylon, uh, th then suddenly you, you notice it, right? And this is the fruit of that kind of intellectual skepticism, you know, uh, about real about being able to know reality, right? Uh, it, it's not uncommon to find the opinion that of all the diversity of pre-Nicene Christianities, plural, certain strands were selected by Roman emperors and chosen as the orthodox ones, right? Then we have a problem, right? Because the, the problem is, look, the very foundations of our faith are historical, right? Not simply theoretical. And so we have to get this right. There's a lot at stake when it comes to the intellectual question of historical epi epistemology, right? Um, we cannot allow historical epistemology to be reduced to some kind of skepticism about actual knowledge. We cannot allow history to be reduced to the telling of edifying tales uh, or, or something like that. You know, in, in the pseudo-wisdom of the modern world, you hear this all the time, uh, that all historical con conclusions are ultimately the prejudices or the worldview of the historian. Uh, you know, the pendulum has swung very, very far in this direction. Now, part of what I would blame is the scientific optimism of, of 19th century thinkers, right? Um, they were overly ambitious. I mean, you can look at Leopold von Ranke and say he's being overly ambitious about scientific history. He describes it as um, Geschichte wie es eigentlich gewesen, right? The history as it actually happened. Uh, and so this German empiricism maybe made them overly optimistic or idealistic uh, about uh, how scientific you could be in the acquisition of historical knowledge. Uh, but with all due respect to legitimate criticisms of von Ranke, I think postmodern skepticism about finding truth through historical science is more poisonous and more deeply problematic, and the pendulum has swung way too far. And it's in this respect that I'd like to look at Newman. Because right? if we look at John Henry Cardinal Newman, we find a powerful counterexample. We find a man whose historical research, now I, I insist on this, it's his historical research as distinct from his religious convictions, as distinct from his philosophical or theological convictions. His historical research led him unwillingly against all his prejudices, against all his preconceptions, against the whole bent of his intellectual formation. His historical research led him to embrace the Roman Catholic faith. Thus, briefly, my thesis today is that Cardinal Newman, underrated as he is as a historian, can serve as an example for Catholic historians speaking to the world of secular scholarship, speaking in the profession right now, uh, as well as speaking to popular audiences and students. Newman serves as this example precisely because he possessed, in combination, a confident approach to the obtaining of historical knowledge, in the true sense, along with the erudition, the tools, and the work ethic to dig for that knowledge. And in a more specific way, I'm going to argue that um, Cardinal Newman's approach to the, to the history of the early church, particularly the church before the Council of Nicaea, can serve as a seedbed of inspiration for a new generation of scholars of late antiquity seeking to escape the tyranny of certain postmodern methodological approaches that dominate the profession. And if we're going to go into those a little bit as well, I hope you'll indulge me. Uh, I think it's fascinating. Uh, but the, the consequences and implications for, uh, for our faith and for our church are very real and very immediate. And there, there, there's a lot at stake here. You can't go into combat with secular scholarship, scientific academic scholarship, using simple two-bit Catholic apologetics. Uh, it, it, it doesn't work. It's like showing up to a machine gun fight with a spork and uh, expecting to, to win. Uh, you need real scholarship to combat this stuff. And, uh, and Newman is, is a model for us as scholars. Uh, Newman's great study of the Arians of the fourth century uh, it's an absolute monument of, er of erudition, and this is what we want to look at. This was released when um, Cardinal Newman was younger than, than most of the faculty, certainly younger than I. It was 1833. It's Newman as a, as a young man. 
And uh, he was, of course, an Anglican at the time. His command of the subtleties and nuances involved in the Arian controversy, whether theological, philosophical, social, or political, along with the sheer volume of source material that he displays mastery of, it commands immense respect, immense respect, more than 185 years after its publication. It remains marvelous. Uh, Newman begins with an extraordinary clear framing of Arianism as a historical phenomenon within the church explaining in his first few paragraphs that he proposes to trace the origins of Arianism between the first and second general councils. Right? Now, when he says that, he, he's framing the issue chronologically. He says, when we look at Arianism historically within the church, we are talking about the period between Nicaea, which is 325 AD, and the Council of Constantinople, which is 381. Right? These, he argues, uh, are Arianism's natural chronological limits. Whether by Arianism we mean a heresy or a party in the church, okay. Uh, beyond 381, we'd say that Arianism exists as a phenomenon outside the church, an extra-ecclesiastical phenomenon. Uh, so in the beginning, he says, in the council held at Nicaea in Bithynia in 325, Arianism was formally, formally detected and condemned. In the subsequent years, uh, it ran its course through various modifications of opinion and with various success till the date of the second general council held at 381 in Constantinople when the resources of heretical subtlety being at length exhausted, the Arian party was ejected from the Catholic body and formed into a distinct sect exterior to it. It was during this period, 325 to 381, uh, while it still maintained its hold upon the creeds and the government of the church, that it specially invites the attention of the student in ecclesiastical history. Okay. Afterwards, he says, Arianism presents nothing new and it's in its doctrine, and it's only remarkable as becoming the, animated, the animating principle of a second series of persecutions when the barbarians of the north, who were infected with it, had possessed themselves of the provinces of the Roman Empire. So very, very clear chronological framing uh, to his problem, very clear historical framing. So what, what does he do in order to illuminate the character of the controversy? What's fascinating about this is that Newman has to delve into the murky origins of Arianism in the age before Constantine liberated the church from persecution. A lot of funny things happen to Christianity when you stop persecuting it. Um, and, and, and the emergence of, of Arianism is, is certainly one of the most striking. Um, so, so you have to delve into the pre-Constantinian era uh, to figure out from, from what seedbed does Arianism derive uh, its origins. And of course, Newman is, is up to the task. Um, his handling of the incredibly disparate, technical, difficult source material, laden with philosophical and theological subtlety, it's not just the work of an able theologian. It's the work of a historian who's the master of his craft. He's a master contextualizer, and he's a master at historicizing what would otherwise be misleading and potentially confusing theological debate. Theological debate which could actually easily be cherry-picked to create real apologetical problems for the church. And uh, this is a major point. It's not Newman the theologian to the rescue here. It's Newman the historian. One does not find in the anti-Nicene church the kind of technical precision in philosophical language used to describe the divine mysteries, like the Trinity or the incarnate word. One doesn't find the technical precision that you find in the ecumenical councils themselves. Right? This makes sense, of course, um, that, that precision in technical language is precisely what was at stake in the ecumenical councils at Nicaea, at Constantinople, at Ephesus, at Chalcedon. Right? It was the gift of the fourth and fifth century councils to the history of the church. So when you're searching for pre-Nicene teaching uh, among the pre-Nicene fathers on Christ or the Trinity, you could do what some historians have done uh, and what some Protestant apologists in the 19th century actually did, right? You could just say, look, well, it's a jungle out there. Uh, holy smoke. There's no settled Christianity or orthodoxy in this period. Um, you could do what, what a lot of post-structuralists do with the source material, uh, what a, a Derrida or a Foucault-inspired scholar might do, and, and they often have done. Uh, just say, well, you have not Christianity, but Christianities, plural. Multiple Christianities. And the Christianity that we come to know and love later on, uh, that's really a creation of Roman emperors, you know. And you could just do that if you want, right? And... A theologian can't really rescue you here, right? It's Newman the historian, Newman the contextualizer to the rescue, coming in and, and putting things right, right? So this is not Newman as a two-bit religious apologist, right? He's not even arguing from his faith. He's arguing from historical science. 
And he points out how when dealing with the writings and fragments of figures like Justin Martyr, Origen, Gregory of Neo Caesarea, even Athanasius, even Athanasius himself, of course it's easy to find examples of disparate modes of expression drawn from the technical vocabulary of an eclectic mix of Greek philosophical schools. Uh, much of it very different from what was codified later at the councils, and you see the implications here. Uh, but Newman, with immense precision, with a keen eye for historical context, which is something that's often lacking in contemporary ecclesiastical debates about anything, uh, he's able to show that these anti-Nicene patristic writings, uh, dialogues, fragments of the fathers, they actually represent the fathers accommodating their speech to the specific needs of the various unbelievers whom they were trying to convert. So Newman he actually has a, a phrase for this. He calls it economy of language, the economy of language of the anti-Nicene fathers. And he says, in, in these instances, they weren't trying to hammer out an orthodox Christology in the face of a dissident Christology. Right? Because as of yet, there was no clear emergence of a dissident Christology. There was no heretical Christology yet that was clear. Uh, rather, what, what the fathers are doing before Nicaea is ministering to Jew and Greek alike, according to their needs. And so despite this variation in pre-Nicene theological formulations uh, and the occasional imprecision of pre-Nicene theological formulations, Newman argues that it's the Arians who are the innovators. The Arians are too clever by half. They emerge as innovators. Uh, and it's they who are corrected and anathematized at Nicaea. It was their heresy. Newman further argues right, that this heresy received unnatural long life through the support of the emperors. Right? It was not Orthodox Christianity, but rather Arianism, whose life was, was basically put on life, a life support machine uh, by Constantine and Constantius II, and through the energy and creativity of Arian partisans, until by the Second Ecumenical Council of 381, it was clear to all that Arianism was formed into a sect exterior to the Catholic Church. And, uh, quote Newman now, taking refuge among the barbarian invaders uh, of the empire, Arianism is merged among those enemies of Christianity whose history cannot be regarded as strictly ecclesiastical. Right? Uh, and this is the point. So what's fascinating for us is how Newman's original motive, his original motive for being interested in the anti-Nicene church and the Arian controversy was to find a way to vindicate the Anglican position. He wanted to vindicate the Anglican position as a kind of via media between the, uh, the infidelity and apostasy of the papacy on the one hand and the excesses of the Protestants on the other hand. Right? He wants to vindicate the Anglican position as the via media. Now, it, it's fascinating because all the implications of his, hist his uh, historical research here on the Arians, um, they disturbed him. They unsettled him. And yet he, he published this volume in 1833 as a Protestant and he remained a Protestant for 12 more years. Now, it, it, it's fascinating because what we see here is the, the excellence of his historical research actually upsetting rather than confirming his convictions or his biases. He began to see the Anglicans more and more as not being analogous to the Catholic party in the early church at all, but to what he calls the semi-Arians, that is people like Eusebius of Caesarea, like Eusebius of Nicomedia, the people who persuaded Constantine to tolerate Arianism and compromise with orthodoxy. So uh, he also sees, um, I it's interesting, he sees Anglicans as being dependent on the support of secular princes, right? Just like the semi-Arians, being dependent on the, on the support of princes for the survival of their peculiarly compromised sect, doomed to be amalgamated once and for all, either to the Catholic Church or the, to the collection of her various alternatives and enemies outside of it. So it's fascinating. We see Newman the historian actually converting Newman the brilliant Anglican divine. So the excellence and the impartiality of his historical research is what fascinates me here because Newman, you know, he publishes his work as an Anglican. Uh, the History of the Arians of the Fourth Century, 1833, was reissued in a third edition as late as 1871, uh, by which point Newman had been a Catholic for decades. And what's interesting in, uh, about this is that when he issues the third edition in 1871, he puts a little note with it, and he explains, you know, I, I wrote this when I was very young, and uh, some of my conclusions are expressed a little bit dramatically, because that's what young people do. Um, but after my conversion, I only had to remove two sentences from the whole book. And those sentences were sentences that had nothing to do with Arianism. Uh, they, they were little f polemical flings against Catholics that he had put in there. So he, he took them out and put them in an appendix. And um, it, it, it's, <laughs> it's really interesting, right? Um, 
because the rest of his original work was sterling and he left it untouched, right? This actually provides us with a background for understanding so many of the things that Newman says in his famous essay on the development of Christian doctrine, right, once again. Uh, I'm not going to get too ambitious talking about that essay, um, but I, I would argue that the essay on the development of Christian doctrine, it's often cited in a kind of facile way as a catch-all justification for the idea that doctrine just evolves or something like that. You, you can just have development or something by making up new doctrines, and that's explicitly contrary to everything that Newman says in there. Uh, in, in, in fact, I think if Newman were writing that same essay today, he would, he would leave it the same, but he would change the title. He would call it an essay on the continuity of Christian doctrine, because that's what it's about. And he makes this point at the very, very beginning. Um, and Christianity, he says, has been long enough in the world to justify us in dealing with it as a fact of the world's history. Okay, follow me here. And Newman says, Christianity's genius and character, its doctrines, precepts, and objects, cannot be treated as matters of private opinion or deduction. Uh, it may indeed legitimately be made the subject matter of theories, right? whether it's moral or political excellence, uh, was it, it due location, the range of ideas, the facts which we possess, divine or human, blah, blah, blah. But his point is that Christianity is, is, is no theory of the study or of the cloister. It has long since passed, he says, beyond the letter of documents and the reasonings of individual minds. It has become public property. Its sound has gone out into all lands, its words unto the ends of the world. It has from the first had an objective existence. Okay, this is the point. Christianity has had an objective existence. It has thrown itself upon the great concourse of men. Its home is in the world. And to know what it is, we must seek it in the world and hear the world's witness of it. So what he's arguing against here, uh, what's the point? Uh, the point is th there's this hypothesis, right, which is met with wide repetition in these latter times, right? And that is, in Newman's words, early 19th century, uh, he, here's the hypothesis that he's rejecting. He says, Christianity, <laughs> it's the hypothesis that Christianity does not fall within the province of history, that it is to each man what each man thinks it to be, that Christianity is to each man what each man thinks it to be and nothing else, and thus in fact is a mere name for a cluster or a family of rival religions altogether, religions at variance with one another and claiming the same appellation, not because there can be assigned anyone in the same doctrine as the common foundation of all, but because certain points of agreement may be found here and there. Now, Newman is way ahead of his time. Uh, he could not possibly have stated more clearly the opinion of the modern post-structuralist historian of late antiquity. The kind of post-structuralist methodology that's dominated the study of late antiquity uh, professionally since the 1970s would say precisely this. And Newman foresaw it, and he foretold it like a prophet in the 19th century. Right? Uh, the, the coming of this idea, insisting that Christianity is not Christianity in antiquity. Christianity is Christianities. And um, this can be a, a kind of a disturbing thing when you first encounter it. For me, it was, uh, it was about 15 years ago when I gave actually my first conference paper as a, a graduate student. Uh, and it was a conference paper on the conversion of, of the Roman Empire in the fourth century. And literally one of the first questions I got from the audience, from a senior scholar, was why are you talking about Christianity? Right? What is Christi we don't talk that way anymore. We talk about Christianities. Um, and it's a very common handle or, or, or catchphrase. Uh, it's a sort of a shibboleth among post-structuralist influenced historians, right? But Newman foretells this, right? And uh, part of Newman's point is that the actual hard spade work of historical scholarship is the antidote to this, right? He says, let men consider. If they can criticize history, the facts of history can certainly retort upon them. Uh, he says, uh, <laughs> I want to be clear on this great subject. History is not a creed or a catechism. It gives lessons rather than rules. Still, no one can mistake history's general teaching in this matter, whether he accept it or stumble at it. Bold outlines and broad masses of color rise out of the records of the past. They may be dim, they may be incomplete, but they are definite. And this one thing at least is certain. Whatever history teaches, whatever it omits, whatever it exaggerates or extenuates, whatever it says or unsays, at least, Newman says, the Christianity of history is not Protestantism. Right. Now that fits with his polemical point, uh, but I, I think we can take this passage uh, from Newman from the essay on the development of doctrine and, and apply it in some sense as the basis 
for forming an argument against modern post-structuralism as well, right? If you can criticize history, the facts of history can retort upon you. Bold outlines and broad masses of color rise out of the records of the past. They may be dim, they may be incomplete, but they are definite. And the, the hard work of scholarship is what's necessary to illuminate these things. Okay. Um, many trends have come and gone in scholarship on late antiquity since Newman's time, of course. Very dominant throughout the 19th century was uh, the theory of Gibbon. Edward Gibbon's work on the decline and fall of the Roman Empire placed all of late antique history into a paradigm of decline. Decline and fall and decadence, right? So the rise of Christianity means decadence. And the rise of all this obsession with theology, it means a decline in civic virtue. It means ultimately the doom of an empire, right? And it's a, a very persuasive, sort of prima facie, plausible way of looking at the decline of the Roman Empire, right? Now, there's a big reaction against it in modern times. There's a big movement to see late antiquity uh, in the 20th century, not as a time of decline or decadence, but as a time of tremendous cultural creativity. Ironically enough, this movement, uh, it arises not from some rediscovery of the genius of Christianity, right? Uh, it, it, the movement against Gibbon actually arises in some sense from neo-Marxism, okay? Now, what's interesting here is that it's, uh, you know, French intellectuals, French neo-Marxist historians in the 20th century began to make the argument that um, events themselves are the ephemera of history, right? And this, this is a powerful, powerful shift in the way that historians think. If the events themselves are the ephemera of history, then what's really going on in the past is the movement of broad structures of thought underneath, broad, deep cultural and psychological waves, the movements of mentality underneath the surface, right? And the role of the historian is, is, is then changed because now your role is to, to kind of cherry pick and grab pieces of evidence from all over the place, uh, from all over the long durée, right? To illuminate the mentality of a period, right? And, and, and a period can be a, as ill-defined as you want it to be, right? And you want to regard certain events and orthodoxies, theology, empires, politics, battles, kings, all the stuff that you usually talk about in, in history class, these are all ephemera, right? dogmas, debates, events, the rise and fall of empires, ephemera. So um, this movement is very influential, all right? And it's cast into um, incredibly sophisticated form by a scholar named Peter Brown. Uh, Peter Brown utterly transformed the way that people think about early Christianity and about late antiquity, right? And um, what, what Peter Brown thinks on these subjects has evolved over the decades. I, I, I do have to say that. In his latter days, Peter Brown has made um, some remarkable intellectual shifts, right? But his early work <laughs> remains disproportionately influential, uh, in, in part because of the number of graduate students that he trained, and in part because of the, the number of imitators uh, that, that he inspired, right? Um, so Peter Brown is, is, is a guy, he's an extraordinary, extraordinary man, right? And um, we have to draw from the inspiration of Newman if we want to respond to his work. Uh, Newman works scientifically with sources. He works systematically with sources. And this is the antidote to dealing with, with, with something like Brown uh, or the, the scholarship that he's influenced for nearly four decades, right? So to, to go back to the beginning of, of Brown's uh, career, in 1971, Peter Brown wrote a truly seminal article called The Rise and Function of the Holy Man in Late Antiquity. He followed this work up with a number of books and monographs, um, but his article on the rise and function of the holy man, it's really interesting. It provides a useful laboratory for examining his thought and method, although he modestly describes the essay as one that merely raises problems worthy of following through for many years to come, quote unquote, uh, there is a great level of conceptual and methodological maturity, okay, which is derived from Peter Brown's mastery of both English and American schools of anthropology and his mastery of no fewer than 26 languages. So it's one of these things. If you want to deal with issues like this and have debates with scholars like this, you're going to need a bigger boat, right? It, you, you, you can't just go in with, with good intentions here, right? It, this is very sophisticated stuff. So Brown begins his article with the observation 
that although scholars and particularly social historians have noticed that the holy man uh, is, is important and uh, he played an important role in the society of the fifth and sixth centuries, that scholars have nevertheless failed to investigate why the holy man, this becomes a term of art for Brown, why the holy man held such a role. He attributes this failure to the social historian's preoccupation with the lower classes of society, which led them to stress the spectacular occasions when the holy man intervened to lighten the lot of the humble and the oppressed. So Brown points out that uh, these episodes illustrate the prestige that the holy man had already gained, but they don't explain it. All right? So what, what he envisions as the goal of his project is the rewriting of the social and religious history of the late Roman world, using the figure of the holy man, his origins, his continuing function in society, to throw light on the priorities, fears, hopes, and aspirations of the average late Roman citizen, quote unquote. So the holy man is an exceptional figure in late antiquity. For Brown, the holy man is the hermit. The holy man is the stylite. The holy man is the miracle worker. The holy man is the man you go to when you need an exorcism for your epileptic children. And uh, you, you find these holy men in, in late antique sources in the Eastern Mediterranean in the fifth and sixth centuries, right? And so instead of undertaking a Newmanesque systematic contextualization of the sources, right? What Brown does, he goes here and there and he grabs the things that he thinks are, are holy men, right? And he tries to find what's common about them, right? Not because he's interested in holy men, but because he's interested in the rest of society, right? So we're going to construct a systematic social anthropology on the basis of looking at the holy men. Uh, he ends up constructing an elegant, complex theoretical structure, right? So he's being an artist with his mind, just like a modern philosopher, right? And what he ends up doing is arguing that the holy man is the guy who took on the vital functions that had formerly been performed by the patron, quote unquote, in the village life of Syria, right? Before the rise of Christianity. So there, there's this, this figure in a Roman Syrian village called the patron, the prostates, and he says the role of the patron was to exercise power. And when you read Peter Brown articles, you get used to him using Greek words and sentences just because he can. So he, he never uses the word power because that's English. He prefers the Greek word dunamis, right? So the patron has dunamis, right? And through his dunamis, the patron helps villagers conduct their relations with the outside world, right? So the patron is replaced by the holy man in exercising dunamis, right? And this rise of the holy man, right, who has in himself utterly objective, inalienable power, marks out late antiquity as a distinct phase of religious history. Right? Now, watch what he does here. I mean, uh, uh, towards the end of his article, right, in the rise and function of the holy man in late antiquity, he says, quote, what's decisive and puzzling about the long-term rise of the holy man is the manner which, in which in so many ways the holy man was thought of as having taken into his person skills that had been previously preserved by society at large. The word of the holy man was supposed to replace the prophylactic spell to which anyone could have access. His blessing made amulets unnecessary. He did in a village what had previously been done through the collective wisdom of the community. The holy man was a ruthless professional, a ruthless professional. And uh, as is so often the case, his rise was a victory of men over women uh, who had been the previous guardians of the diffuse occult traditions of their neighborhood. The blessing of the holy man, and not an amulet prepared by a wise woman, was now supposed to protect you from the effects of a green lizard that had fallen into your soup. So he goes on to describe what he calls the, the late antique revolution. Right? What is the late antique revolution? Uh, it's the way in which the, the, this victory of Christianity in late Roman society, he says, it's not the victory of one god over many. It's the victory of men over the institutions of their past. Uh, the medieval papacy, the Byzantine Lavra, the Russian Shtaduk, the Muslim Caliphate, he lumps Islam in here as well, uh, that these are all in their various ways direct results of attempts of men to rule men under a distant high god, unquote. Uh, and that's what the rise of the holy man represents here. So what, what have we done here for Brown? All of a sudden, all these specifics of religion, including the distinction between Christianity and Islam, are real ephemera, right? Uh, mere epiphenomena. Religion itself is an epiphenomenon, uh, completely ephemeral to the history of the time. What's really going on here, it has to do with power relationships. And, and the rise of the holy man anthropologically il illustrates for us how men dominate over other men and uh, use God to do it. Uh, so it, it, it's fascinating. The, the reception of Peter Brown within the academy was absolutely tremendous. Over the past 45, 50 years, he's trained many, many graduate students. There have been fetrifts uh, written in his honor. Uh, he's one of the most influential men within academia. Uh, he's, he's one of those rare academics who crosses the great divide and becomes a celebrity in, 
in the world outside the ivory tower, right? Um, problem here. The, the problems with his evidentiary base are not far uh, to seek. Uh, his many vivid generalizations about social functions in East Roman village life, each is based on a single anecdote, which is interesting. A uh, single anecdote for each. As are his claims about the role of holy men in that context, his assertions about holy men and political power. Also, his definition of a holy man is weird. It's kind of amorphous to begin with. And then it gets really weird because he starts with hermits and stylites whose isolation is essential for their dunamis. And then he ends up talking about the monks of Constantinople mentioned in Theophanes Continuatus. So, so you have this unacknowledged fudging of the definition of a holy man that simply allows him to employ extra pieces of anecdotal evidence which would otherwise be inadmissible uh, to him. And must be observed, sadly, that he, he really doesn't eliminate this flawed method in his more mature work. Uh, in Society and the Holy in Late Antiquity, which is published in 1982 at Berkeley, it uh, brings together a kind of heterogeneous collection of his essays. Um, but, but what he does, he actually purports to contrast the universal mentality of the East, quote unquote, with the universal mentality of the West, quote unquote, how? By contrasting his own theories about holy men with Gregory of Tours, chosen apparently at random. Right? So, so you have this arbitrary cherry picking of evidence, right? uh, and it goes into this artistic and, and admittedly sophisticated weaving of an anthropological picture right now. It's, it, it's fascinating. Right? Now the antidote to this, the antidote to this from a Catholic perspective is Catholic scholarship. And, and, and this is why we bring up Newman as our inspiration. What, what Newman has to say on the subject is, is fascinating. He says, the intellect, this is Newman, the intellect which has been disciplined to the perfection of its powers, the intellect which has learned to leaven the dense mass of facts and events with the elastic force of reason. Such an intellect cannot be partial, cannot be exclusive, cannot be impetuous, cannot be at a loss. It is almost prophetic from its knowledge of history, right? Now, Newman delivers a, a series of almosts here to make it clear that he's not talking about the effects of grace, he's not talking about the effects of supernatural virtue, he's talking about the effects of intellectual formation. Newman says the mind is almost prophetic from its knowledge of history, and when he says prophetic, he does not mean that you're able to predict the future, right? That's not what he means by it. That's very, very important. I have to address this with students all the time. You, you don't study history so that you can predict the future. It doesn't work that way, right? But wh wh what does he mean, prophetic, right? He means being able to speak to your own times the way the prophets did from a knowledge of history, right? And uh, in, in Newman's writings, history takes its place in a catalog alongside other ways in which the educated man has been formed. So Newman goes on, uh, the educated man is almost heart-searching from his knowledge of human nature. He has almost supernatural charity from his freedom from littleness and prejudice. The educated intellect has almost the repose of faith because nothing can startle it. Right? So the upshot to, to all of this is that as a historian, right, Newman here, he's no mere storyteller, no mere man of faith seeking edifying narratives to fit a preconceived worldview. If Newman the historian had been seeking preconceived narratives, he would have died a Protestant. There's no doubt about it, right? On the contrary, it's Newman, the intellectually honest scholar of history, who's compelled by the depth of his acquaintance with the early church to convert, cutting against the grain of all his preconceived ideas, all his ideological commitments, and all his worldly interests. Um, Newman believed that there's truth to be found in historical scholarship, right? Especially important for us in light of the fact that the very truth claims of our church and our faith rest upon a historical basis. Newman shines forth for us as a model for the role that the historian can play in the service to the church today. No one other than the trained historian is equipped for the kind of rigorous uh, work that can shore up the solid foundations of the church's claims, right? And the need for historical scholarship and historical education, I think, should be clear to all of us. Uh, Cardinal Newman was a firm believer in these things, and he was a man who was confident that you could know the past. So, thank you.